What is up everybody, Duck here, and today I'm going to be talking about speaker specs, aka the field small parameters, and how they're used to describe how speakers work. As you can see, these are both 12 inch speakers, but other than that, physically they look completely different. This one is a PA driver for use in high efficiency systems, above 50 hertz traditionally, whereas this one is a standard home or car subwoofer which is used lower than 50 hertz traditionally. So how do we describe the operational differences between these two woofers? By using the Thiel Small parameters originally conceived by Neville Thiel and Richard Small. These parameters, by the way, are based on WinISD as a standardized kind of formatting system. WinISD is a free box uh, design software, uh, link in the description. First off, the simple specs. So RE, RE is the DC resistance of the speaker measured in ohms. If I were to take this multimeter and connect it to the voice coil of the speaker, I would get a resistance of 7.2 ohms. Please note though that resistance is slightly different from impedance. I'll describe that later on. Next one we have DD or driver diameter. Driver diameter is simply the surface area of the driver's diameter. So for this speaker you'd usually measure it apex to apex. Or on this speaker apex to apex. This is not a standard speaker. As you can see from here to here, so this one would be uh, about 24.5 or just slightly under 10 inches of driver diameter. SD is based on driver diameter and is the surface area of the driver usually taken in square centimetres. A square centimetre is about a sixth of a square inch, thereabouts, and is that distance there except a square. This driver is as close to 600 and this driver is closer to 500, 530-ish, I believe, as compared to 580. Now, even though these are the same drivers, because this driver has such a thick surround, it actually ends up having a lower driver diameter. Now, please note that the surface area is not based at all on how deep the driver goes. So you can't just have an infinitely large driver by going super deep. That's not how it works. It's just the flat area. Imagine if you were to fill this with sand, that would be the area of the sand. Now the next one is the X-Max, and this is where this speaker is going to come in handy. Now the X-Max and the X-Mech are different. The X-Mech is how far a speaker can be pushed at its maximum. It's just the furthest you can push the cone in. The X max is considered linear, which means that if the speaker is doing at or under its X max, the driver movement should be very smooth. Once it gets past the X max, it starts to jump up and jump down and sit there for a bit waiting to change direction. It can become non-linear. The X max is found by the height of the voice coil, which in this case, oh, I've got about a two centimeter voice coil. The magnetic gap, which is this part right here, is about six millimeters. So 20 minus six is 14, which means that there's 14 millimeters of coil not in the gap. Now, because the coil moves out and moves in, that means that it can move seven mils up or seven mils down. So this speaker has an X max of seven millimeters. Its X mech, however, could be closer to an inch. And the final one of the simple ones is the volume of displacement. Now, the volume of displacement is the X max times the area. So, for this driver, since I had an X max of 14 millimeters and an area of 530 square centimeters, that means I've got 1.4 times 500, which is about 750 as the volume of displacement in cubic centimeters or milliliters. Every time the cone moves at X max, it can move 0.75 liters of air. So that's what VD means. All right, now we're gonna start moving on to maybe the kind of a bit harder to understand parameters. So MMD and MMS. These two parameters are 
More commonly, MMS is used, but MMD is the raw mass of the diaphragm. Now, ignoring the basket on this, it's the moving mass of the diaphragm, the spider, as well as the voice coil. These all make up the soft parts or the moving parts and make up the MMD. The MMS, however, is slightly more than that. It's essentially, it's all these components plus the weight of the air around them. So if you imagine I had the same voice coil with a very small cone, it'd have a very small MMS and the difference between the MMD and the MMS would be very similar. But imagine if I had a super thin, enormous cone, there'd be a lot of air mass surrounding that cone and that would create it, that would make it have a much higher MMS than its MMD. And that's the reason why MMS is traditionally taken. It's a more realistic measurement. Now the next one is CMS, which is compliance measured in millimeters per newton, sometimes meters per newton, but millimeters per newton is a lot easier to understand. Now the newton is a unit of force. One newton is equal to one kilogram being accelerated at one meter per second. Here though, we are not accelerated at one meter per second, we're at 9.8, which means that one kilogram sitting on the bench would weigh, would exhibit 9.8 newtons of force. So one newton of force delivered by gravity is roughly about 100 grams, about 102 grams. The CMS of a driver is, if you imagine, I would have put one newton of force on this driver and measure how far down it goes That measurement of how far it dips is its CMS. Next we have the FS, or the resonance frequency of the driver. Now this is a well-known parameter, as it's pretty easy to understand. The resonance frequency is found by the two components I just mentioned, which is the MMS and the CMS. Heavier diaphragms have a lower resonance, lighter diaphragms have a higher resonance. Stiffer diaphragms have a higher resonance and looser diaphragms have a lower resonance. Although these speakers have the same area and possibly the cones weigh about the same, this one, although it is a paper cone, it does have a much larger voice coil on it. But this driver is, and remember it does have the spider in there still, this driver is very soft compared to this one. And that is designed so this driver operates better at lower frequencies. So the MMS and the CMS make up the FS, the resonance frequency, they're responsible for that. Next is the VAS. Now the VAS of a speaker is the equivalent volume of air equivalent to the suspension. So the suspension is, once again, the spider and to a certain extent the surround. Now it's a factor taken off the surface area of the driver and how stiff the suspension is. Very stiff suspensions lead to a small vas. Very small cones also lead to a small vas and the inverse large cones, loose suspension, very large vas. This speaker had a vas of, because it's a softer driver with a lower resonance, had a vas of I believe around 120 litres, whereas this one, because it's much stiffer, even though it's the same area, its vas is around 40 litres. If I had a 12 inch diaphragm, which was completely loose, and a 40 litre box, and would have push on it, it would feel similar. Alright, next I'm going to be talking about the electrical parameters of the speaker. The first one is the LE, which is the inductance, usually in millihenries. The LE is an effect that you always get. Now, a speaker contains, believe it or not, a coil of wire. And the thing with coils of wire is they like to make magnetic fields. Magnetic fields don't like to be changed. Once they're created, they like to stay there. Once they're destroyed, they don't like to be created again. That's just how they work. So, for AC frequencies that want to create then destroy, then create, then destroy, they don't like that that much. LE, or inductance, is an effect that lets low frequencies flip through 
but it doesn't let high frequencies through. It's used in crossovers, that's why there's coils in crossovers. The higher the inductance of a driver, the less it likes letting through the high frequencies. Although it is a factor based off impedance. So if you have an 8 ohm subwoofer with an inductance of 4 millihenries, it acts like, I believe, a 2 ohm subwoofer with an inductance of 1 millihenry. So not all 10 millihenry speakers would have the same cutoff point at the high frequencies. That's another reason why you usually want tweeters to work alongside mid-rangers to work alongside bass drivers, because bass drivers just cannot do treble at all. One of the reasons. Now, the next is BL, which is Tesla meters measured in <laughs> newtons per amp. As I mentioned before, one newton is equal to one kilogram accelerating at one meter per second. And we're accelerating at 9.8 due to Earth's gravity. A BL of one means if one amp is coming into the speaker, is going through the coil and coming back out, it will push with the force of one ohm. Now usually BLs are a bit higher than one, often they're pretty often above 10, anywhere up to 25. I've even seen drivers, neodymium drivers with a BL of 35. The higher the BL, generally the more efficient the speaker is for a given impedance. So if, for example, I had a 2500 watt subwoofer with a BL of, say, 20, 2500 watts at 1 ohms is equal to 50 volts and 50 amps. So there's 50 amps coming into the speaker and going out. Since it has a BL of 20, that means it produces 20 newtons of force per amp. And we've got 50 amps, which means 20 times 50 is 1000 newtons of force. That's the equivalent of 100 kilos. I'm a bit less than 100 kilos. So that just goes to show how much force some speakers can put out. Now next we've got the Xenom. Now the Xenom is the nominal impedance. As I mentioned before, resistance is different from impedance. Impedance is quite hard to label though. This is a 7.2 ohm DC resistance sub and it's quoted as being an 8 ohm impedance sub. Now, unfortunately speakers, impedance changes depending on the frequency. This speaker has an impedance of 40 ohms at its resonance frequency. Now 40 ohms is a lot higher than 8 ohms, which is why impedance is a bit subjective. Now, if I were operating this speaker at around 500 hertz to 1 kilohertz, it would be in what's known as the linear region of the impedance, which is where it sits at 8 ohms, and I'd call it an 8 ohm speaker. But if I was only using it between the ranges of 40 hertz and 60 hertz, then I'd be able to call it maybe a 12 ohm speaker. So that's a bit subjective. I would say to be on the safe side, the impedance of a speaker should be its, resist, uh, its resistance plus about 10%. So for this 7.2 ohm speaker, I would say eight. And for a 3.6 ohm speaker, I would call that a four ohm speaker. Now the next is PE. PE is incredibly simple to understand. It's just the wattage of the driver in RMS. I just decided to have it in this part as I'm talking about the electrics of the system. Now, the next two are also a bit subjective, SPL and USPL. SPL is stated as being taken at the resonance frequency one meter away from the speaker. SPL is one watt at one meter, whereas USPL is 2.83 volts at one meter. Now, the difference is, in order to get one watt of energy out of an eight ohm speaker, you need to put in 2.83 volts. So for an 8 ohm speaker, the SPL is the same as the USPL. Whereas for a 4 ohm speaker, 1 watt is its SPL, but 2 watts is its USPL. As when there's 2.83 volts going into it, twice as much current flows compared to the 8 ohm sub, which means twice as much power gets sent to it. And thus it has a USPL about 3 decibels higher than its SPL. So for one ohm subwoofers, stating their USPL gives very impressive numbers, but their regular SPL, not so much. 
but of course they're designed to operate in a box so USPL and SPL are not a good indicator of how loud a driver is in reality. For example, this 25 hertz sub, if it's in a big box, can do 25 hertz, but in open air with the driver flapping, it's going to be hard to register anything, whereas this one can do a decent job of 50 hertz in free air. That's the reason why PA drivers are often super efficient compared to car subwoofers. Even though once they're in their boxes, this one definitely competes with this one, especially at 20 hertz. This one kicks this one's ass. And now for the final two electrical parameters I'm going to be talking about, which is RME measured in kilograms per second and MPOW measured in newtons per square watt. Both of these equations describe the strength of a motor. So if you've got two different speakers, you can plug their parameters into this to see which one has the stronger motor system. Stronger motors make speakers operate more efficiently and can have a better control over the cone. It is generally sought after to have a higher motor strength. For example of how this works in practice, consider a 4 watt signal is being fed into the same speaker. It's a dual 2 ohm speaker. One configuration is wired in series, which goes up to 4 ohms. The other one is wired in parallel, which goes down to 1 ohm. For the 4 watts into 4 ohms you'll get 4 volts with 1 amp and you'll read a BL of 20. For 4 watts into the 1 ohm configuration you'll get 2 volts and 2 amps of current flowing and you'll see a BL of 10. Now if you plug both these numbers into the BL over the square root of RE which is the Ampere equation you'll see that 20 divided by the square root of 4 equals 10 which is the same as 10 divided by the square root of 1. So both the motor strengths are the same because it is the same motor, rather obvious. And just goes to show how BL is dependent on the DC resistance of the speaker. Now something else to mention is how MPOW is measured in newtons per square watt. The reason why is because as say you had a 1 watt into 1 ohm which is 1 amp and 1 volt, if you were to take that up to 100 watts you would have 10 amps and 10 volts. Now the problem with that is that the newtons is per amp. So because you're only increasing your amps by 10 times when you increase your wattage by 100 times it means that it actually ends up being per square root of the watts. So it doesn't increase linearly. If you put twice as much power into a speaker, it doesn't put out twice as much force. And now the last group of parameters I'm going to talk about are the Qs, RMS, QMS, QES, QTS, and EBP. First off, we've got RMS. Now, say for example, we had a steel ball rolling across a carpeted surface. You can see you roll it and gradually the ball will come to a stop, assuming the surface is flat and all that. So you put energy into the ball, but it eventually loses its energy. Where did that energy go? Can't be created or destroyed, which I believe is the first law of thermodynamics. So where did the energy go? Well, if we keep a track of how much energy is in what form, we can see it starts off with all the energy being kinetic. All of it's the rolling energy. Then it gradually turns into thermal energy stored in the carpet. Now, of course, you probably never rolled something across the carpet and gone, wow, the carpet's really hot after I've rolled that object across it. And that's because it usually takes a lot more energy to heat stuff up than it does to do physical work. For example, a 2000 watt kettle can operate quietly on a kitchen bench, whereas a 2000 watt mulcher creates a ton of sound and can shred trees. So, so there's a lot more energy in heating than there is in mechanical work, which is why you don't really notice it often. Although we're not dealing with steel balls here, we're dealing with springs, or rather speakers which are moving in and out. Say we had a perfect spring in a vacuum, there's no resistance on it. After we give it a twang, it's going to keep ringing forever, and it's just going to go spring potential, which is when it's right at the edge. Then it's going to turn around, turn it into kinetic energy, go back to spring, go back to kinetic, and it'll keep going forever. Now, of course, speakers don't operate in vacuums. They wouldn't do anything. They operate in air. So if we have a look at what happens when we have a perfect spring in air, 
we can see it gradually fades down and it stays the same frequency but it gets quieter and quieter as the energy goes from being in the spring to being transferred to the air by means of sound or even a bit of friction with the air. But we don't want this with speakers. As soon as the signal stops, we want the speaker to stop. Otherwise, things are going to overlap and it's going to get muddy and you're going to lose definition. So what we do is we add a bit of resistance to the spider in order to calm down the resonance. So here you can see an example of a bit more of a damping effect. This is caused by the friction or the resistance in the spider and a bit in the surround as well. This is the RMS of the speaker, not the Watts RMS, the mechanical resistance of the suspension. This number alone doesn't tell us a whole lot, and just like FS is a lot more useful than CMS and MMS, it's a lot more useful to know the resonance than the mass and the compliance, it's a lot more useful to know the QMS than it is to know the RMS. So this equation here, uh, this is derived by WinISD by the way, although I couldn't find it anywhere else. Uh, we can see RMS fits into the equation right here. Now, something rather interesting about the Qs is that the smaller the number they are, the more damping there is. The bigger the number they are, the less damping there is. With this RMS value on the bottom, that means the bigger the RMS, the smaller the QMS and the more damped it is. So the bigger the RMS, the more damped the speaker is. But of course, we've still got a lot of overhang. We've still got all this extra sound coming out after the speaker. How do we get rid of that? We've actually got another option to get rid of that, which is electrical damping. Now, if you remember that you've got a coil of wire in the magnet, and it's something interesting about a coil of wire is it acts as a generator, which means if you try to take energy away from it, it's going to stop moving it's going to damp it it needs to get that energy from somewhere to turn into current and that's from the movement of the speaker so with electrical damping is similar to the qms equation you can see we've got the same square root of mms divided by cms and the 10 times pi except now i've got re over bl squared now if you remember from earlier bl squared divided by re is one of the motor strength factors so RE divided by BL squared is also an indicator of motor strength, but instead lower is better. Now something interesting is once again with QES, the lower the QES, the more damped it is. So the stronger the motor in the speaker, the more damped it is. And this is how QES is calculated right here. Once again derived from WinISD. Now with damping, since the smaller the Q, the more effect it has on the damping, it actually means we need to use some interesting equations in order to add the QMS and the QES together to get the QTS, or the total damping. As a QES of 0.1 means a lot more damping than a QMS of 1, we need to use this equation here where 1 over 1, for example, plus 1 over 0 0.1, which equals 11. So the QTS is actually 1 over 11, which is roughly 0 0.09. So that's how the QTS is calculated. The QTS, of course, being the total natural damping of the speaker. Now, the very last thing I'm going to talk about is the EBP, or Efficiency Bandwidth Product. Now, the EBP is found by FS divided by QES, where you can see on this graph, which is from my how to choose the best subwoofer, uh, you can see that below 50 is better for sealed or fourth order, around the middle 75 is good for either or, and above 100 is better off for ported or sixth order bandpass band pass enclosures. So say for example, you had an FS of 25 and a QES, of 0.5 you would be right down here at 50 if you had an s an fs of 50 and the qes of 0.5 you'd be at 100 which is up the other end so you'd be better off for ported and this concludes my ts parameters video this was a long one and did require quite a bit of research and was in preparation for a video i'll have shortly 
are presenting how to calculate the TS parameters for yourself using just a multimeter. So stay tuned for that one. If you enjoyed and are interested in more similar videos, uh, click subscribe and also hit the like button. Uh, leave a comment if you've got any questions and I'll see you in the next video.